Hey guys, what's up? Alex Torelli here. In this video, we're gonna talk about how to beat your home games. If you're playing in private games, um, I've coached a lot of clients in situations like this, played in quite a few private games myself over the past many years, but recently especially. And I'm gonna give you the top three tips in this video to beat your poker home game. And you probably noticed in playing in both home games and in casinos that the pace of play, the flow of the game, the way that people play, the types of hands they play, the types of pots you see are very different than what you see at a casino. And so because people play different, the exploitative adjustments that you can make to maximize your profit are, are going to be different in a home game than what you would see at a typical casino. Home games typically have much more aggressive uh, players, many more crazy hands, much fewer pros, a uh, higher rake, which is something to consider. And uh, you're gonna wanna subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, because in subsequent weeks, I'm gonna be dropping videos on how to adjust to uh, the rake in home games and, and the considerations about that as well, and some tactical things you need to be aware of uh, to make sure that you're a winner in these games and adjustments you need to make. So subscribe for that video. But for now, we're gonna talk about the three, three strategies that, that I've used to help clients uh, win more in these home games and, and the adjustments I've made myself uh, in, in playing in these as well. So the first one is to play better starting hands. And I think the biggest mistake people make is they, they play too many hands and they especially do this out of position and in three bet pots, right? So these are the, we'll break down each one, but those are the things to watch out for where I find that people are losing the most amount of money. Okay, so play stronger hands. What does that mean? It means that most people, if they're not getting the results they want in home games, it probably stems from the root cause of starting to play too many hands. And this is very tempting in home games because everyone else is doing it, right? So it's like you go to a bar, everyone's drinking, you don't order a water. And it's kind of like that in a home game where like, you know, you, you sit down and you maybe observe for a half hour and then you know, some guy's calling a three bet or a re-raise with queen five suited, another guy's in there with jack seven, another guy has seven four, and you're sitting there folding ace jack, and you're like, well, what the heck, everyone's playing all these terrible hands, I wanna get in there and gamble too. And so the tendency is to, to lower your starting hand requirement to play more hands. Now, the problem, with, the problem with this is just think about it from a first principle, right? Your edge is the fact that you play stronger ranges and stronger hands and you start each hand with a mathematical edge. So if your starting range requirement is up here and your opponent's is down here, well, all of that delta is your edge in the game. But if you lower your starting hand requirement to meet them down to the level of play that other people are playing at, and these are, these are poor, inferior players or the VIPs as we call them in our games, like you're lowering the quality of your starting hands and you're giving up your edge. Right, so the way to do it is to play stronger starting hands and always come in for a raise. Avoid the temptation to limp in. If your hand is strong enough to play, you should pretty much always raise with it. There's a couple exceptions that I get into in nuanced situations with, with individual clients and depending on the, the, the structure of their game and, and whatever, but 95% of the time you can just avoid limping altogether and just always raise preflop. And that's a great way to approach every hand you play. And then take the worst, let, let, let's say you're playing, you know, hundred hands. Let's say like in the, in the scope of a day or a week, you play a hundred hands. What I think most of my clients would benefit from is taking, you know, 65 of those hands, the best 65 and playing them and chopping off 35. So like the worst 30%, the bottom 30% of the hands that you're playing, just fold all those hands. Just don't play those hands at all. And it's different for every person, depending on your games and how many hands you're playing. So I can't, you know, Without personalized attention, I can't just give like an exact number. It's kind of like saying, well, how much weight you need to lose or how many calories do you need to cut? Kind of depends on how much you're eating and, and how overweight you are, right? It's kind of like that with, with, with poker hands, starting hands. But the, the point is to play stronger hands, right? So you, you always want to make sure like a good framework is that the hand that you have, right? The type of the hand that you have individually is stronger, is better than the range of hands your opponent can have. So if you're thinking about re-raising preflop, and your opponent opens in late position and you have, you look down at ace jack. Like, is ace jack better than the average hand that they're raising with? If, it's, if it is because they're raising with 35% of hands, they're playing, you know, queen seven suited and jack seven suited and seven four suited, 
go ahead and re-raise with your ace jack. You have a very strong hand relative, again, hand strength is typically relative unless you have aces or kings, right? Like it's, it's relative to the hands that your opponent has. So is your hand stronger than the relative strength of the hands that your opponent has? If so, you wanna play that hand aggressively, especially if you're in position. The way that I see people getting in trouble is they call raises or re-raises out of position with marginal holdings. So they either limp in and then call a big rate, like let's say you know we're playing, um, I don't know, 25, 50, limp in for 50, someone makes it two, 300, and they call 300 out of position with a bad hand. And then, you know, like, I don't know, queen 10 offsuit, something like that, that they get themselves in trouble. Uh, another another situation where, where I see clients getting in trouble is they open the pot, so they raise to, let's say we're playing 25, 50, they make it 200, and someone makes it 700, and they're out of position and they call a raise with, you know, like king eight suited or something like that. Like, not a great hand, it's like, not a, absolutely abysmal hand, but. Not a great hand. You don't want to be calling re-raises out of position with marginal holding. So, you know, offsuit hands, offsuit Broadway hands, uh, like random non-connected suited hands, like, you know, king five suited and stuff like that. Uh, you want to be folding all those hands, especially out of position facing re-raise. The last situation I see people play too many hands is when it goes raise, call, call, re-raise, someone calls and then they call, right? So you still have the player behind you that could four bet. He can, you know, the, the pot is not, the action's not closed, meaning someone else could re-raise behind you and force you out of the pot. And so people cold call, like, you know, say it's 25, 50, goes 200, call, 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 1,000. They call 1,000 with, you know, $25 or $50 in the pot or no money in the pot. And there's all these players behind them that could re-raise them out of the pot. So those are the situations where you want to play stronger hands. The second piece of advice I have is to uh, adjust to the loose nature of your games. So most of the time people tell me stories of hands where they're like, you'll never believe what happened to me, Alec. Uh, you know, my client, John, whatever, says, Alec, you'll never believe what happened. Um, I played this hand and this guy called me to the river with bottom pair and then he hit two pair and, and uh, you know, whatever. Or I was I was bluffing and I made this great bluff and the guy called me down with bottom pair and he just never folds and this guy's such a fish and a donkey, whatever. Cool. So those things happen very common. You might be nodding your head right now like you have a story, something very similar that, you know, it's, it's a home game hand. You would never see that happen in a casino, right? Because it's a home game hand. That's the way that home games play. So the adjustment, like, right, what, how do you exploit your opponents to, to outplay them because of their inefficiencies and their weaknesses and their poor play, right? So the adjustment is to bluff less frequently. And this is very boring and it tests a lot of people's patience. And the reason people don't get this simple adjustment right is because it's simple, but it's not easy. And so you, you have to be very, very patient. So you're combining your preflop adjustments of playing fewer hands, which is already difficult to do when you see everybody gambling with these crazy bad hands, it's hard to sit back and wait, especially when you're card dead. And if you're playing in a home game, you could be card dead for four hours because you play 25 hands an hour. Four hours of hands is 25 times four, it's 100 hands. You could be card dead for 200 hands. So it's very difficult to sit back and wait for strong hands pre-flop. But then when you double down on that post-flop and you bluff less frequently, it's even more boring because even if you have ace-king and you're not card dead, you get ace-king and ace-queen, you flop a pair one third of the time, you go three ways to the flop on jack seven four with you know two of a suit that isn't your suit. So you have ace-king of spades, jack seven four with two hearts, you're against three people, you know, you just check fold there. And that's extremely boring. You can't maneuver your way through pots. You're not gonna be betting the flop and setting it up for a double barrel on the turn. You're not gonna know where you're at. People aren't folding often enough. They're floating you with any two cards. There's too many people in the pot that play too many ranges pre-flop. And so you just have to be patient and you're gonna have to double down on that patient by bluffing less frequently. And the, the reason this works is because the way that people play in home games is they rarely fold. So they do not fold often enough. And because they don't fold often enough, like you know, Newton says, for every action, there's a, there's a reaction. So the reaction to someone not folding is you don't bluff and you value bet thinner, which means you value bet with more hands, and you value bet bigger because they're not folding. So you bluff less often, you value bet wider, and you value bet bigger. So those are the, that's kind of like one component of adjustment, right? And without getting too much in the, in the, the, the weeds of you know, exactly what bet sizing to use and stuff like that, um, that's the adjustment. So an example, let's say you raise preflop, and your opponent calls, and this guy's very loose, uh, calling station, plays a ton of hands, doesn't give you a lot of credit. Flop comes down, whatever, 10, nine, five, okay? And he checks, you bet, you have 10, eight suited, uh, you raise the late position, he calls. 
right? And the, the, the turn is like a, a six. Now, normally here, you might be checking behind for pot control. You don't want to get check raised and you're afraid he has a better 10 um, and, and you're not going to get called by many worse hands in this spot. But in, in, against these types of opponents, you might want to bet again, even with something like Jack 10 or a weak 10 or maybe even Ace 9, uh, because your opponent has so many draws and they have so many weak hands that call the flop, they have so many weak hands that call preflop, their range of hands they play is wider in all situations. So you're going to have to value it thinner. You're going to have to deny equity more often. Denying equity basically means that you're betting, you're putting money in the pot with strong hands to either fold out hands that your opponent has that have a good chance of winning. So something like King Jack or King Queen or Jack Queen Jack or um, a, a nine or, you know, like a nine seven with, you know, turned a, a gut shot and he has a pair, so he has all these outs. So you're gonna to have to be betting more often. You're gonna to have to be betting thinner, and you're gonna to have to be betting for value, and you're gonna also size up, because a lot of these types of players, especially in home games, they, they have this player profile that is uh, weak and passive. So they play a lot of hands, and they play them weak and passive. So they call a lot, they limp a lot, they're sticky, they don't like to fold, they don't give that much credit, they get to the river with way too many hands, and so they're playing too many hands, they're calling too often, but they raise very rarely. It's very rare that you see someone in a home game, I mean, it depends on your home game, but it's, it's rare that you see people that play a lot of hands and they're very loose, but they're also hyper aggressive and they're attacking and they're putting people to tough decisions, they're turning hands into bluffs, they're you know betting on cards that are favorable for their range and stuff like that. You don't see that as often. Most of the time you see people that are weak and passive, and so they call too often, and the adjustment you wanna make is to be betting and charging them to draw and to put money in the pot, okay? So the last, the third adjustment, there's, there's many more, but the third one I'm gonna cover in this video is to really know your competition. And this is something that's very unique to home games because in a home game, you play with the same people very, very regularly, right? Like, you know, we play in a home game and, you know, we play twice a week and maybe there's 20 people that are in that player ecosystem that rotate and so nine of them or like basically half of them are at the table at any given time and you know you play not everybody plays twice a week but if you play eight games a month you might play with the same players four times out of the eight but there's only 20 people you play with and you play with them over the course of months weeks years months and potentially sorry days weeks months and potentially years i got this backwards and uh so you really build up reads on these players you build up history with these players in a way that you can't at your local casino right if you go to the commerce in LA or you go to the Bellagio in Vegas, there's maybe 5,000 people that play in that game, right? If you consider all the tourists and people that come in for the week, plus the regulars, people that live there, there might be thousands and thousands of people that play in that ecosystem that supports that, um, that game. So think about a home game is like an aquarium, right? In your house, there's not that many fish. They're kind of all the same fish. They're pretty controlled and they might breed, but they don't create that many new ones. I'm going far off with this analogy. And you know, uh, the Bellagio is kind of like uh, the Mediterranean Sea. There's a lot of shit going on over there and there's a lot of different people and, and fish in that ecosystem, right? So a home game is very, very niche. And so when you know your competition and you, you can start to profile those players, you can do two things. Number one is you can understand the tendencies of the people you play against and start to exploit them. So you really wanna be looking for uh, certain types of players profiling them and understand what their betting patterns are. And you're gonna find weaknesses and inefficiencies in their betting patterns, and then you're gonna do the opposite and adjust. So I'll give you one example. Um, let's say you know you know that this player that you play against uh, doesn't like to re-raise. He calls a lot, folds a lot, but every time he re-raises pre-flop or she re-raises pre-flop, um, they have very strong hands. Every time they check raise, they have very strong hands. Well, that's really good for you because you can just pile on the aggression, right? Pile, 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 pile. And as soon as they re-raise you, you know that they have a certain classification of hands. Like let's say, depending on the positions or, or the player, you know, they have jacks plus and ace king. So jacks, queens, kings, aces, ace king. Great. If you have a hand that could bust one of those hands, you call preflop. So even if you have a hand like, depends how deep you are, but if you have a hand like seven, eight suited or pocket fives, you, you don't care that they have aces. So you, you want them to have aces because if you hit your five or you know seven, eight, you hit your, your straight or your two pair or your trips, you're not gonna lose much money if you miss, right? You know what they have, so you're not gonna be putting a lot of money in the pot when you have the worst hand, unless you're drawing to a better hand when you have a lot of implied odds. Or you're gonna hit your hand and the asymmetry is gonna allow you to bust them and win a lot of money when you make your hand, right? This is especially true in a lot of the home games that I see where 
let's say you play a 510 home game, the buy-in is 5,000. And you're in, you're in one of those games where the blinds don't really matter. People are putting in a lot of chips in the pot and there's a lot of opportunity to play really deep stack poker. And so this asymmetry, right? The stack to pot ratio is being very deep, meaning you have a lot of chips relative to what's in the pot, allows you to play these more, uh, I don't, they're not speculative, but these, these more, uh, the drawing hands preflop, right? Like pocket fives, you're drawing to a set, seven, eight, you're drawing to a straight or whatever. Um, so you could play these drawing hands preflop against this type of competition. Right? And so those hands are perfect to play against those types of players, but it requires you to profile that opponent first. The second thing you could do when you know your competition is the opposite of profiling them is you can start to be, you know, use self-awareness to be aware of who's aware of your image, right? So the first step is being aware of what your image is. Are you the type of player that gets a lot of credit for really strong hands? I worked with a client that had the player profile that I just described to you. He was only three betting with very, very strong hands. He always got credit for having the nuts. When he see bet post flop, uh, people gave him credit. Maybe they call him once, but if he ever bet the turn, they would always fold unless they had a set and he was complaining. Like every time I get it in on the turn of the river with aces, I get stacked. I'm like, well, I don't, I don't wanna say his name, but I was like, John, that's because they know you have aces every time you reverse pre flop and bet the turn. So they're only putting it in when they can beat you. So we started to adjust his game. He was aware of his image and we basically cashed in on that. He had been playing this way for like years in this home game. He played with the same people all the time. And basically we started doing adjustments where like he would be bluff raising the river, right? So like when he raised the river, it was always the nuts. So people would fold like bottom set, middle set to him because he always had like top set or a straight or a boat or, or whatever it is. And so he can get away with these bluff raises. And especially when you combine that with um, strategic hands that you have, like if you have, you know, let's say the board has three diamonds and you have the ace of diamonds. So it's like, John, raise when you have the ace of diamonds because you know they can't have the nut flush and therefore, you know, they're never gonna call you because they're only calling you with, you know, basically nutted hands and you have the, the hand that prevents your opponent from having the nuts. You can use your image because you know your competition, you know your image, you know the cards in your hand that block your opponents from having those strong hands and you put all that together and you can execute a bluff raise, right? So if you do that bluff raise once a night, your opponents are never gonna assume that you're bluffing. You're never gonna show them. You're timed it correctly. You're not really gonna get caught. And you know, you win a hundred big blinds, like once a night making this play, right? Like, so let's say, you know, the pot's uh, you're playing 10, 20, and you know, the guy bets $800 on the river. You make it 3,000, they fold. You know, you win that 800 plus what's in the pot. So you win, you know, $1,500. That's a lot. It's like a buy-in for executing one play once a night with the right timing because you know your competition and you know your image and you know when you can execute these certain plays, right? So that image is something that you build up in a home game in a way you don't in a tournament, right? You sit down in a tournament, you play for eight hours with the same people. Yeah, you build up an image over eight hours, but it's not like you have this huge history with these people. You might get moved tables and you're not gonna play with them again tomorrow. So it's like, there's not really any history. You just kind of use, you know, the current flow of the game and game theory to kind of like make your decisions, right? So home games are completely different. And so knowing your competition, knowing your image is a huge way to improve your home game skills. So I hope this video helped. If you want like me to guide you on this journey, I work with a lot of people that play these home games and help them to achieve great results. Uh, hit me up, you can just check the link in the description. There's a link to hop on a call with me and uh, I can potentially coach you for something like this, point you in the right direction if not. Um, otherwise, let me know which tip is your favorite. Let me know what strategies uh, are you're using in your home games or what questions you have and I can try to answer them in future videos. Um, subscribe to this channel because I'm also putting out in this, in this next period, uh, more content about home game strategy uh, from working with clients and playing these games myself and some of the key takeaways that is really helping people dominate these home games. So a lot of stuff you're not gonna wanna miss. Subscribe to this video and uh, subscribe to this channel. I'll see you in the next one.